Hi there, I'm Dr. Terry Shaneyfeld for UAB School of Medicine. In part two of this four-part series on subgroup analyses, I'm going to describe the criteria you should evaluate a subgroup analysis against to make sure that the researchers designed it properly. Remember, the more criteria that are met, the more plausible it will be the subgroup effect. So these are the five criteria that you should think about when you evaluate the design phase of a subgroup analysis. And we'll go through each of these individually. I have developed an app called EBM Rater, which you could use to critically appraise a subgroup analysis and uh, any other study design. So first off, subgroups should be based on characteristics that the researchers determine at baseline, prior to any intervention being received by the participants. And the main reason is that prognostic um, characteristics can and usually do emerge as patients receive interventions and are undergoing follow-up. So this figure is from a study that was done in critically ill patients who were admitted to the ICU who were randomized to intensive insulin therapy or conventional therapy. And a subgroup analysis was undertaken to compare outcomes between those who stayed in the ICU for greater than three days and those who stayed in the ICU for less than three days. Now the length of ICU stay would not have been known prior to randomization. There'd be no way of telling how long a patient was going to need uh, to be in the ICU. So this was a characteristic that developed after the study uh, was ongoing. So hopefully you can understand that patients who stay in the ICU fewer than three days are going to be very different prognostically from those who stay in the ICU greater than three days. So it might be that the treatment, in this case intensive insulin therapy, didn't have any real effect on the outcomes. And it was just that the prognostic differences between the patients really drove the findings noted above that intensive insulin therapy in this group who stayed in the ICU grade in three days had a in-hospital survival benefit. So it may be a spurious association. So subgroup effects should also be evaluated within a study rather than between studies. So this is a meta-analysis of a variety of studies looking at vitamin D and non-vertebral fractures. And the subgroup that was broken up was low-dose vitamin D versus higher-dose vitamin D. And you can see over here in this forest plot the effects. And if you look at this, it seems that higher-dose vitamin D leads to less vertebral fractures, whereas the lower dose really has no effect. So what do you think about this? Is this a real finding? Well, one of the things, if you look over here at the different types of study, is none of them are really the same. So part of the problem is that they made subgroup effects by looking at different studies that compared vitamin D to placebo. What we'd really rather have is a head-to-head -head comparison and trying to examine subgroup effects within this. So there's several reasons that could explain differences that you could see between studies that really wouldn't be possible if you did a direct comparison type study. So there could be different patient populations or characteristics amongst all these studies, and there probably are because they're done in different hospitals, different clinics, etc. There could be slightly different co-interventions that are done between studies. So other things like, you know, was the calcium intake exactly the same? Was exercise exactly the same, etc.? The outcomes could have been measured in a slightly different way. Interventions could have been applied in a different way. The formulation of the drug could be slightly different between these studies. And then finally, there could be secular trends. You can see this one study was in the mid-90s. Some of the others were in early 2000s. So there could have been slight differences in how things were done over time. So the bottom line is you'd like to see really head-to-head -head comparisons or at least subgroups done within the same study, not across studies. So researchers also ought to be able to say upfront what they think the subgroup effect will be and its direction. And what I mean by direction is will it be beneficial, will it be harmful? So this ought to be done ahead of time and not really after they look at the data because after that you look at the data you can figure out what the potential subgroup effect will be. A subgroup effect is more plausible if it's thought of ahead of time and then tested for. And we worry about anything that sort of is looked for 
or rises after data is analyzed is really a fishing expedition, trying to find something positive. Now finally, researchers shouldn't do lots and lots of subgroup analyses. Only a small number of hypotheses should be tested. And this figure from the New England Journal of Medicine demonstrates why that's the um, fact. And one of the things that this editorial tried to look at is the probability of a false positive finding based on the number of subgroups tested. Let's just focus on this red line for now, which is at least one false positive test. And if you do, let's say, just 10 subgroup analyses, which is not out of the realm. Many studies do 10 or more subgroup analyses. You have about a 40% chance of finding at least one of them being positive and not being a true positive, but being a false positive. And this formula up here can help you calculate um, what the chances of a false positive test. And that X is the number of tests that you run. So all you got to do is plug that in. And it'll give you your chance of having a false positive find. You can, so you can see the more hypotheses that are tested, the greater the false positive rate. And I go through this uh, in greater detail in a later video. So finally, if you'd like to read more about these topics, these are the um, articles that I use to develop this series of videos. I hope this video has helped you understand how a subgroup analysis should be designed. In the next video, we'll look at how a subgroup analysis should be undertaken statistically. Remember, if you have any questions, you can contact me through the Contact Me section of my blog. Have a great day.